welcome to our Thursday Bible study. I invite you to take your Bible and open to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. We are approaching uh, the latter portion of the Gospel of Matthew. There's 28 chapters in Matthew. Uh, so we, uh, we have probably 10 weeks, at least 10 weeks to go. Uh, maybe a little longer than that before we move on to, uh, to another book. Um, but I want you to notice something about the very first sentence in Matthew chapter 19. The first sentence starts this way. Now, when Jesus had finished these sayings, this is the fourth time that we see this phrase um, in the Gospel of Matthew. I think we have mentioned several times since we began Matthew that there are actually five discourses in the Gospel of Matthew. There are really five special teaching sessions that the Lord Jesus had not only with his disciples, but in many cases, uh, the crowds were listening in. But he had five special discourses, and at the end of each one of these discourses, you will see this phrase, uh, or one very similar to it, where it says, now when Jesus had finished these sayings. So chapter 18 that we looked at last week was the fourth of five discourses that Jesus will give uh, throughout the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, you, you'll notice the, the very first one um, that was the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and so that covered chapters 5, 6, and 7 of Matthew. So that was discourse number one. Um, it was actually his most lengthy uh, discourse or teaching session. Um, so we see that in um, Matthew uh, chapter 5, 6, and 7, discourse number 1. Discourse number 2 is seen in Matthew chapter 10. And, and you notice in Matthew chapter 10 was when Jesus brought his disciples together and was preparing them for a um, actually a several-month-long ministry. And where his disciples were to go out throughout um, Israel and to share the message of the gospel. And Jesus gave a special discourse uh, to his disciples at that time in Matthew chapter 10. Um, and then we get to chapter 13 of Matthew. And in chapter 13, of course, is the parable of the sower. And there are many types of soil um, that the seed would fall upon. And we covered that in detail in Matthew chapter 13. So that was the third discourse in Matthew 13. And then last week we looked at Matthew 18, where Jesus uh, talked about, he talked about forgiveness. Um, he talked about the church. He talked about church discipline. Um, and you'll discover that that was uh, discourse number four. Now, discourse number five, we will cover in uh, several weeks from now, uh, because discourse number five, the final discourse, is referred to as the Olivet Discourse. And that is in Matthew 24 and 25. Those two chapters take up discourse number five, the Olivet Discourse, which he gave on the Mount of Olives. And of course, that was referring to the second coming of Jesus Christ and all the details that Jesus shared with his disciples about what would take place both prior to and during and subsequent to uh, his second coming. Uh, so we'll be uh, in that uh, in, in several weeks. My guess is we'll be somewhere toward the end of November uh, when we're dealing with the with the Olivet Discourse. So whenever you see that phrase, and uh, we find it five times in Matthew, when Jesus had finished these sayings, he then moves on to more general teaching, um, which is addressed basically um, to the crowds. And so when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. Now, there's something we need to know about that region, um, because Jesus going to that region had some significance. 
Um, now, if you have maps uh, in your Bible, you notice that Perea is one of the provinces um, of, of Israel, and it's on the east side of the Jordan River. So Perea is on the east side. So Jesus, remember, and his disciples, they were on their way to Jerusalem. Um, that Jesus was now leaving the region that he really ministered to the most. Uh, Jesus really spent the majority of his time in the Galilean region. Um, many people think, well, he spent all of his time in Judea or in Jerusalem. No, he really didn't. He was there um, for the particular feast that they were to celebrate. But Jesus ministered mostly in the northern part of Israel in the region of Galilee. Now, Perea was on the other side of the River Jordan. It was east of the River Jordan. It, it was called the regions of Judea. This is why it, it says he entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. In other words, east of the Jordan. But there's something significant about this area called Perea. Perea was that part of Israel that was ruled by one of Herod the Great's sons. Now, if you re recall, historically, um, Herod the Great died in 4 BC. That's when he died. And instead of one of his sons taking over uh, his kingdom, if you will, it was divided um, among four of his sons. And, and of course, one of those sons was Herod Antipas. And Herod Antipas, he was a ruler um, over Perea. Um, so what was significant about Herod Antipas? Herod Antipas was the Herod that had John the Baptist executed. Um, and why did he execute Herod Antipas? Well, he was actually tricked into that execution. And he really didn't want to do it. Uh, Herod Antipas didn't because he was kind of afraid of the crowds. And, and, and the crowds loved the ministry of John the Baptist. So why did Herod Antipas execute him? Well, he was tricked by his wife's daughter. And uh, keep in mind what was going on with Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas, he liked his brother Philip's wife better than his own wife. So what did he decide to do? Well, he, he decided to go and take his brother Philip's wife for his own wife. Uh, he was a very immoral man. And of course, John the Baptist pointed out um, what Herod Antipas did, and he said, you should not do that. It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And so what happened? Well, John the, John the Baptist ended up in prison. So Herod Antipas didn't mind putting him in prison uh, because it was probably a good thing for him to, for Herod Antipas to do in his own mind because that would keep John the Baptist from being out among the people preaching and, and teaching things like morality, something that Herod Antipas uh, was very shy on, morality. So he put him in prison. Um, but while John the Baptist was in prison, um, Herod's birthday came around. Um, actually, it's the only two times in the Bible that the word birthday is found. One was the birthday of Pharaoh, so we read about that way back in the book of Exodus, and then there's the birthday of Herod Antipas. And so for his birthday, he had this elaborate party, and uh, just like Herod Antipas uh, being short on morality, um, you know, they, they had dancing girls at this at this party, and one of those happened to be the daughter of, of the wife that he took from his brother. And she performed this dance, and um, 
Of course, they were probably all half drunk. Um, and he said, uh, he, he liked her dance so much, he says, he said to her, what do you want up to half of my kingdom? What would you like? And Herodias, who was Herod Philip's wife, who then became Herod Antipas's wife, she said, ask him for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And of course, that's, and now Herod, uh, although he didn't want to kill uh, John the Baptist, he felt, well, he made this promise in front of all these people, so I better fulfill my word. And of course, that's how uh, John the Baptist ended up being beheaded um, as a result of this elaborate party that he had. So you say, okay, um, I, I get that. What does that have to do with Matthew 19? Well, what it has to do with Matthew 19 is because, keep in mind that the Pharisees were, were constantly following Jesus, but not in the good sense that you and I use that term, following Jesus. What, what, what I meant by following Jesus was they were literally going everywhere he went in order to kind of trap him into saying something against the Roman government. And, and the reason they were seeking to find a, a, a word or a teaching that he gave that would be against the Roman government is that then Rome would then want to execute him. Because keep in mind, the Jews, although they had a, um, a relative amount of power in uh, managing their own people, one of the things that they could not do was execute. Uh, and, and so they had to find uh, some uh, egregious sin against Rome in order for, um, for Rome to execute Jesus. So here they are in Perea. They're on their way to Jerusalem. Um, and, and many of the Jews, if they're traveling from Galilee, which is in the north, if they were traveling from Galilee down to Judea, um, keep in mind that between Galilee and Judea is a province called Samaria. And keep in mind, we, we read in here that the Jews and the Samaritans never got along. Um, they, uh, they actually hated the Samaritans. So most Jewish people who were traveling from Galilee down to Judea, where Jerusalem was, they would cross over the Jordan and come down through Perea in order to avoid traveling in Samaria. Um, and, and so that's what's going on here. And, and actually later uh, or earlier than this, uh, Jesus actually, he, he didn't mind traveling through Samaria. Uh, as a matter of fact, he had a, a ministry to perform in Samaria when he stopped at the well. Remember where the Samaritan woman was at the well? But here in this case, they were actually in a hurry to get to Judea because they were going down uh, to Judea to get to Jerusalem for the Passover. Um, and, and so they crossed the Jordan River and they were traveling through Perea. Well, the Pharisees... Um, kind of the, the ruling leadership, if you will, of, of the uh, Jews, they decide, aha, Jesus is in Perea. That's the land of Herod and Tippus. This is a great time to ask Jesus about divorce. This is a good time to ask him about divorce because, you know, he... Uh, already knew about what happened to John the Baptist. And so they were trying to get him to say, well, uh, divorce is good. And then the Jews would uh, be angry with him. Or he would say, they would expect him to say, well, it is wrong. And then Herod and Tippus would be after him like it was after John the Baptist. So here was the, uh, I guess you would call it from a human point of view, a dilemma but with Jesus, there's no dilemma. He knew exactly what was going on, and he knew exactly what he was going to say. 
So, let's continue reading. So, um, he entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan, and large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. Keep in mind, wherever Jesus went, he was healing people. He, he was demonstrating to the masses that he was indeed the Son of God. And so uh, he was healing the crowds, and while he was in the midst of this healing, the Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? See, now that's the key to this question. He said, is it, they said to Jesus, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? Now, knowing a little bit of the history of the region is important for us to understand why they asked this particular question. Uh, because actually in the, in the first century BC, let's, let's say in the 100s BC, all the way through the 100s AD. So we're talking like about a 200 year period, all right? A hundred year, uh, years before Christ and a hundred years after Christ. So in that 200 year period, there was among the Jews constant um, talk about the subject of divorce. And the reason why they were so interested in talking about it is because so many of them were divorcing. Um, and, and they weren't divorcing for any good reason. They were divorcing because, well, they, the, the, keep in mind that women did not have any rights at all during this period of time. And, and so the men, if, uh, if they found uh, somebody uh, better to their liking, maybe they found a prettier woman and you would just write a certificate of divorce, say, here's your certificate of divorce, go on your way, I, I'm going to marry this other person. I mean, this was the kind of morality that was going on. And so what did the Pharisees do? Um, they were trying to get Jesus uh, entrapped because no matter what he would say to that question um, it, it could cause uh, negative feelings about Jesus well here's the thing to, to remember what was going on during that 200 year period 100 BC all the way through the end of 100 AD there were two key rabbis who actually held positions with regard to divorce and remarriage. One was the house of Shammai, Rabbi Shammai, um, S-H-A-M-M-A-I. The house of Shammai was very conservative. And, and they said <clears throat> the only reason that was legitimate for divorce was immorality or adultery on the part of the, of the spouse. So the, the house of Shammai said, all right, divorce is okay um, if you found that your spouse um, was involved um, with another man. So that was the only reason for divorce according to Rabbi Shammai. Rabbi Hillel, H-I-L-L-E-L, -L -L, Rabbi Hillel took the opposite position. And he was of the opinion that you could divorce your wife for any reason at all. Um, some of which has come down through history in that Hillel said you could divorce your wife if she burnt your toast in the morning. Uh, in other words, uh, it was just so frivolous that you could divorce your wife for any reason. So there was this constant going back and forth between Rabbi Shammai and Rabbi Hillel. Uh, and so the Pharisees, now in the territory of Herod Antipas, um, the well-known divorcer, uh, the one who divorces his wives um, all the time, they ask this question to Jesus. All right, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any 
cause. In other words, they were saying, where are you? Are you a Republican or a Democrat? <laughs> well, I mean, it, that, that's what it would have been like in Jesus' day. In other words, they were saying, are you with Shammai or are you with Hillel? So they, they, they were trying to get some bickering going on here. So how does Jesus answer? Look at what he says in verse 4. He answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. All right, now, here, uh, I love the way Jesus answered questions. I, I think we've seen as we've gone through the Gospel of Matthew. Remember how Jesus answered questions? He answered a question by asking a question. And he did the same thing right here. And keep in mind, he's probably putting these Pharisees on the spot because obviously the Pharisees were, were known as teachers of the law. So he says, oh, by the way, have you ever read Genesis? You know, think about that. He's asking this question in, in, in front of the whole crowd. And he said, have you really read Genesis? What is Jesus doing there? He's quoting Genesis 1.27 and Genesis 2.24. He, he, he's quoting these two verses that talked about um, marriage in God's eyes made the husband and wife one flesh. And, and he, he, he's quoting, uh, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So he's, he's quoting Genesis. So now um, he then has to hear from the Pharisees. So he's quoting Genesis where he made them male and female. Um, when he said the, um, the two shall become one flesh, what God has joined together, let no man separate. Uh, or as the King James says, let no man put asunder or separate them. So, how are the Pharisees now going to respond to that? They're, they're, they obviously have read Genesis, but they don't abide by it. You know, it's just like a, a, a lot of people today who say, yeah, I've read the Bible, but I don't see what it says. So, thinking that they were going to, again, entrap Jesus... They, they say to him, in verse 7, they said to him, Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? He said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so, now, there's several important points to address when it comes to how Jesus responded to that. Notice that the Pharisees said, why did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce? How did Jesus respond? Moses did not command a certificate of divorce. He permitted it. There's a big difference between command and permit. So what are, they, what are they talking about? Let's go back to the book of Deuteronomy. So let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 24. And this is what the Pharisees were making reference to when they said, why did Moses command? So what Moses has to say about divorce is found in the book of Deuteronomy. Fifth book into the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1. <clears throat> when a man takes a wife and marries her, if then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her. 
and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house and she departs out of his house. Let's just stop right there for a minute. What was the idea behind a certificate of divorce? The idea of that certificate actually put it in writing. So that certificate gave the innocent party the right to remarry. So that's the whole idea be behind a certificate of divorce. Because if, if one says, well, look, I heard you were married to so-and-so. Are you committing adultery? That person can say, no, here's the certificate of divorce that I have. But keep in mind that the only reason that a certificate of divorce could be given was if there was immorality on the part of that spouse. So this is why you'll notice in, in Deuteronomy 24, the focus is on indecency. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, in the New Testament, um, when, when this is quoted, when this is uh, written in the New Testament, which is a different language, all right? So it's in the Greek language. Um, instead of the word adultery, the, it is the word pornea. And of course, the word pornea is where we get the word pornography. But pornea meant any immoral activity. Um, it, it didn't necessarily just mean adultery. It included adultery, but it was not just adultery. It was immoral behavior. Um, and so the certificate uh, of divorce <clears throat> was based only on uh, in, indecency. Um, and uh, it goes on to say, if she goes and becomes another man's wife, uh, back in Deuteronomy 24, Verse two, if she goes and becomes another man's wife and the latter man hates her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter man dies who took her to be his wife, then the former husband who sent her away may not take her again to be his wife after she has been defiled for that is an abomination before the Lord, and you shall not bring sin upon the land that the Lord your God has given you for an inheritance. In other words, what, what God was expressing was you cannot just go back and forth and, and live with whoever you want to live. And, and so here's what Jesus does. When back in Matthew 19, when they said, why did Moses command? Jesus said um, in verse 8, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. So what did he mean by that? Well, what was the beginning? You go back to Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. And, and from the beginning, um, who knows how long that beginning lasted with regard to um, the permanency of marriage because once sin entered the picture, um, then what did people do? They, they kind of did what they wanted regardless of what God said. But what he was saying is when God established marriage, he meant it to be permanent. He meant marriage to be permanent. Um, and, and this is why he said, from the beginning it was not so. And then look at verse nine. What is Jesus doing? But, and I say to you. What is Jesus doing by even using this phrase? And I say to you. He, he, he did it in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, you have heard thus and so, but I say unto you. He is establishing his authority as the son of God. He's establishing his authority as the one who can say what God says, and he can even elaborate on what the Father says. See, he said, you, um, 
I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and another and marries another commits adultery. So what did the Pharisees do? I think at this point the Pharisees took off. Be, because you'll notice after he says that, look at what how verse 10 starts. The disciples said to him, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it's better not to marry. You don't, you don't hear from the Pharisees again on this issue. They're gone because I think they recognized that they were defeated um, by what Jesus had to say. So the disciples said, well, if this is the case, um, if, if the only way that you could actually end up being divorced was if your spouse committed adultery or, or committed an indecency or an immoral, uh, had immoral behavior, then maybe it's better not to marry. Um, why, why would they say such a thing? Well, it is because they were living in and grew up in an immoral and immoral society in which divorce was rampant. And they, they just figured, well, that's just the way it is. Um, and, and so they said, if this is the case, um, it's better not to marry. So how did Jesus respond to that? When they said, well, it's better not to marry. But he said to them, not everyone can receive this saying, but only those to whom it is given. What, what did Jesus mean by that? He says, not everyone can receive this, but only those to whom it is given. Um, because then he gives um, some reasons. He uh, actually gives three reasons for there not to be marriage. And he gives them here in verse 12. He said, but there are eunuchs who have been so from birth. All right, these are people who, who have a physical ailment, a physical problem, so that they could not uh, carry out the marriage act. So those are eunuchs that were born that way, born unable um, to produce children, unable uh, to um, have a fulfilled marriage. So there are people that were born that way. Second of all, he said, there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men. Now, what's he referring to here? He's referring to slaves. Because keep in mind what happened, many slaves were actually castrated by their owners. Go all the way back to Genesis and remember the situation there with Potiphar and Joseph and Potiphar's wife? Um, many of the um, slaves were made eunuchs. They were castrated by their masters so they would be able to, to serve their wives and, and be the servant of their wife and they, you wouldn't have to worry uh, about anything going on between that slave and that wife. So that's the second, he says, those that are born that way, those that were castrated, um, the, by men, and then he says, um, and then there are those, there are eunuchs, verse 12, the end of verse 12, there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom. Uh, as, as a matter of fact, there were actually some um, of, of the early church fathers that actually did this. I think of um, uh, Origen was, was one of the early church fathers who actually had himself castrated so that he would never be tempted uh, sexually in, in any way. But I think what he's making reference to is not just those who physically made themselves unique, but those who have chosen uh, to live a life of purity for the sake of the kingdom. So he said there, there are three. Um, those that are by birth, those by men, and those who have made themselves you for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who is able to receive this, receive it. I think actually what Jesus is saying here is that it's better not to enter marriage 
unless you have already determined, I am going to remain true and will live with my wife forever. I think that's really what he's saying. Um, no, what, when he's saying, for the sake of the kingdom, let the one who is able to receive this, receive it. In other words, have the knowledge of what God said from the beginning, that marriage was to be permanent. And, and so he said, let those enter marriage who um, are willing to make this permanent and be married uh, forever until death does them part. Now, as you go through the New Testament, there is, there is another biblical reason for divorce. Um, in addition to immorality, there was desertion. And Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And, and I believe that when, when Paul talked about this, um, he, he's making reference to the fact that if the, if the unbeliever departs, let him depart, and the, the remaining spouse is not um, held accountable, and there is divorce and remarriage for the sake of, of desertion as well. You know, this whole idea of irreconcilable differences, uh, most likely it was a lawyer that thought up that one. Uh, you, you know, but never, there's nothing biblical about irreconcilable differences. It, it, it is not a biblical reason uh, for divorce. So, here we find ourselves in these first 12 verses, Jesus talking about divorce because of what the Pharisees uh, question him about. But then beginning in verse 13, um, here's what Jesus has to say. Verse 13, then children were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven and he laid his hands on them and went away. It's interesting that this, this little um, section, verses 13, 14, and 15, after Jesus was talking about um, God's view of marriage, um, he now talks about children. And, and, and he said, look, children are, uh, they're an heritage from the Lord. All you have to uh, look at in, in Psalm 127 is, is that children are an heritage of the Lord. But yet, what did people think, particularly back in that day? Uh, that children were a nuisance. Um, that uh, uh, particularly the men felt this way. Um, and, and so this is why the disciples, the way they grew up, you know, they probably got this same attitude from their own father. Um, the disciples said, take these kids away, leave Jesus alone. He's got more important things to do. Um, but what did Jesus do? G uh, Jesus um, rebuked the disciples. The disciples were rebuking the people, saying to the adults, don't bring your children to Jesus, let him be. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me. Don't hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. I, I think this is another reason why many believe that there is an age of accountability for children. Um, uh, if, if children die be, before they're able to comprehend the message of the gospel, uh, I, I believe that not only because of this verse, but because of what happened to King David, that children, when they die, go to heaven. Um, they, they have not reached that age of being able or being capable of really understanding what the gospel is. Um, uh, I'll tell you, not only because of what Jesus says here when he says, for such is the kingdom of heaven, um, but remember what happened when David 
committed adultery with Bathsheba, um, and Bathsheba had that child, and that child died. And remember when they came in to try to console David after the death of that child, um, what did David say? He says, uh, he, that child can't come to me, but I can go to him. In other words, he's talking about seeing that child in heaven. Um, so don't ask me what the age of accountability is. I don't know what it, what it is. You know, I mean, there are some children that can really grasp thing, uh, things at a, at a young age, and there are others that, uh, that are unable. And I, I also wonder, too, about those that are born with such mental disability that they can't understand. I, I would think the grace of God takes care of them as well, but that's, that's another topic. So Jesus lays his hands on these children, and then he continues on his journey. Remember now, they're on their way to Jerusalem. So while they're on their way, verse 16, <clears throat> and behold, a man came up to him saying, teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? Um, and th this is, by the way, an incident that, that is uh, incident that is recorded in the other gospels. And uh, as a matter of fact, in one of them, um, they, this young man, and we know he's young because of what it says in verse 22, because it talks to him about a young man. Um, but Jesus said, uh, or, or the young man said to Jesus, good master. Uh, and, and Jesus' response is, why, why are you calling me good? There's only one person who is good, and that is God. So what was Jesus doing? He was, first of all, letting him know that, yeah, that he was God. But nevertheless, he says, um, what, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? So here was this man. He was under the impression that most of humanity thinks, you know, that they think that they have to do good deeds in order to get to heaven. Now, let me tell you, that is the lie. That's probably Satan's best lie that, that, that he gave to humanity, thinking that you can get to heaven by your good works. The scriptures throughout are absolutely anti-good works for salvation. Yeah. Now, they are the product of salvation, but they are not the means of salvation. But as you read through this, you're beginning to think, oh, wow, did Jesus really mean that? Because Jesus says, well, so the young man says to Jesus, what good deed must I do to make sure I go to heaven? So how did Jesus respond? You would, you would think at this point Jesus would say, oh, oh no, it's not by good deeds, it's, it's by the grace of God. No, G Jesus didn't even say that. What did he say? Look what he says in verse 16, or 17. He said to him, why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. Now, doesn't that fly in the face of everything else the Bible teaches? What is Jesus doing here? He is using this as a means of helping this young man understand that there is never a human being that keeps all the Ten Commandments. So what does he do? Um, he said, there's only one who's good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. In other words, Jesus is saying, try it. See if you can do it. But what does he say? So the young man says to Jesus, which ones? In other words, he says, he well, I know there's 10 of them. Uh, you know, do, do I have to do all 10? Or uh, So he's asking Jesus. So there's this dialogue going on between this man and Jesus. So Jesus said, you shall not murder, shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother. Uh, so he gives him five out of the ten, but then he adds something that's not one of the commandments. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
So what is Jesus doing here? He is testing this young man. Because keep in mind, um, all of these things that he is making reference to, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't lie, don't steal, all of these have to do with how you relate to other people. Keep in mind that you can kind of divide the Ten Commandments into two compartments. One is how you relate to other people, the other is how you relate to God. You know, it begins, uh, you shall have no other gods before me. So when you take the Ten Commandments, this is what it kind of breaks down to. Each one of those commandments is a reference point to how you relate to God and also how you relate to other human beings. And what is Jesus? He's using all these that relate to other human beings. Now the question is, how did many people get rich? in those days. Most of the time they got rich by not treating their other human beings the way they ought to treat them. You know, they, 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 they would take money, they, they, they would take money from the poor, they would charge high prices from those that, that could hardly uh, uh, afford it. So Jesus is, is using these commandments now about how we relate to one another. And Jesus, of course, knowing that every human being is born in sin and doesn't naturally treat one another the way we ought to treat them perfectly. He, you know, you would think that it got this man thinking, oh, yeah, I kind of cheated this other person, you know, or, I, or I, I did something wrong in my mind as well as in my behavior. No, this young man said, he probably said it with his chest stuck out, you know, very proud. He says, all of these I have kept. What do I still lack? What do you mean by that? He says, look, I'm perfect. <laughs> that, that, that's what this young man is, is trying to say to Jesus, I'm perfect. Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go and sell what you possess Give to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven, and come, follow me. What was Jesus doing? It was another test. It, it was to tell the man, look, if you want to serve me, you need to have perfection. You need to be perfect, and he wasn't perfect. And of course, you and I, who come to faith in Jesus Christ, we're not perfect, but we are dependent upon the perfect one who took our place when he died on Calvary's cross. He, who knew no sin, was made sin for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. By the way, that's, that's probably one of my favorite verses, 2 Corinthians 5.21. Second, my, my, my life's verse, I, I remember when I um, graduated from Moody Bible Institute, um, we were often asked, do you have a life verse? And I, I, I picked Colossians 1.10 as my life verse, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. And I took that as my life first, way back when I was a much younger man. But I'll tell you, another verse that comes a close second to that is 2 Corinthians 5.21. He made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So what was Jesus doing? He was not only teaching this young man. He was not only teaching him that he lacked what God required for entrance into heaven. Holiness, holiness. This is why God said to Moses in Leviticus, he said, be ye holy for I am holy. The apostle Peter quoted that again, be holy for I. So how do we become holy? By relying upon the holiness of Jesus Christ and he alone 
who became our substitute and placing our faith and trust in him. Um, and, and so he's saying to this rich young ruler, as he's referred to in, in the other gospels, it says, when the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. What is he saying? He was saying, I love my money more than I love you, is what he was saying to Jesus. I love my money more than I love you. He was not willing to do what Jesus asked him to do. And by the way, one of the, one of the indicators that you are a genuine Christian is that you're willing to do what Jesus asked you to do. And this man wasn't willing. And, and, and notice that Jesus let him go. Verse 23. I have nine minutes left. Um, Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. You know, the Apostle Paul said something very similar. Um, that, that, that is not easy for a rich person. Why? Because a rich person, um, I mean, there is there's something about being rich that everybody thinks about, at least most everybody. Oh, I want to be wealthy. I want to be rich. I want to be able to take care of myself. But one of the things you'll, you'll discover that riches can be a real curse. Um, because then a person takes that attitude of, of well, I've made myself. I'm a self-made person. Um, and and the, the, there's a tendency uh, to be very proud. But thanks be unto God, that's not true of everyone. There are some very humble, wealthy people. Uh, very kind, wealthy people. But that is not the majority. That's the unusual. Uh, I mean, you, you, you think of uh, uh, Abraham. Abraham was a very, very wealthy person. God used him. Uh, God's not against wealth, by the way. Uh, he's not, and sometimes he blesses people uh, with an abundance of wealth. But how can you um, recognize that that wealthy person is a godly person, More, most likely they are among the most generous people uh, if, they're being, if they're very wealthy. But the Pharisees, even back then, they thought, well, if a person's wealthy, it must mean that God loves them an awful lot. You know, so they equated wealth with being right in the eyes of God. And all throughout Jesus' ministry, he indicated that that was not correct. In fact, his ministry was mostly among the poor. Um, but here's what he, this is why he says in verse 23, I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. He doesn't say it's impossible, but he says with difficulty. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Now this is a very interesting verse. For many years there were, there were Bible teachers that said, well what Jesus meant was that uh, in, in the outer perimeter of the city of Jerusalem before you could go actually into the inner city and get onto the temple grounds, there was this very low cut out in the wall and the camel had to get down on its knees in order to enter that 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 hole that was in the wall and 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 people said well this must be what Jesus meant he must be talking about the the, the camel going to I don't that wasn't it at all <laughs> but what, what Jesus was saying um, he was talking about the impossible um, he, he said when the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. What is he saying? He's saying, Salvation, if it is up to man to be saved, is impossible. You and I 
cannot save ourselves. There is not a just man upon earth that does good and doesn't sin. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This is why we need Jesus. This is why we need to take him as our Savior and Lord, because he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So Peter, when he hears this, what does Peter say in verse 27? Um, See, we've left everything and followed you. What then will we have? What, what was Peter referring to? Well, Peter was saying, look, um, here's me, here's James and John. Um, they, they, left the, they left their father's fishing business. I left my fishing business. So Peter was saying, well, yeah, I think we're doing the right thing here because we, we left our means of making money. And what's going to happen to us? What do we have? Jesus said to him, verse 28, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. He's saying, look, Peter and the rest of, of, of you, 12, yeah, your, your benefit is going to be in heaven. Your benefit is future. He says the, the, the 12 disciples will sit on 12 thrones judging the, the 12 tribes of Israel. And then he says, and then everyone who has left family members, left the profession, left their lands, left everything that is physical in order to follow me, there's a reward coming. And that reward is in glory. That reward is in heaven. Jesus talked a lot about the fact that there are rewards for following him. They're not a means of becoming his child. They are evidence that one has become a child of God. But notice verse 30. And I close with verse 30 because it has everything to do with chapter 20. Um, when he says, many who are first will be last, and the last first. And so we ask ourselves, what did he mean by that? Well, chapter 20 tells us what he meant by that. Mm -hmm. And Lord willing, next Thursday, that's where we'll be in chapter 20. Loving Father, thank you so much for once again having an opportunity to gather with fellow believers to open the pages of Scripture together. Lord, I, I thank you that indeed your holy word is so rich, so powerful, so encouraging, so comforting. And yet, Father, it's also a means of letting those who are outside of Christ know the seriousness of being without him. And so, Father, help us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Help us, Lord, to be not only students of the word, but to be obeyers of the word as well. Thank you for loving us the way you do. Thank you for giving us the instruction in your word on how to live a life that is pleasing in your sight. Dismiss us from this time together, we pray, and we'll give you the thanks and praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.